In this episode, we'll be discussing a hidden struggle that has dominated the rise and fall of civilizations for thousands of years, and how at its core, it defines nearly everything in our reality. The underlying reason why this is important is because it answers questions we have for why things have happened the way they have throughout history and who the great puppet masters of our world really are. Over the course of many years studying these ancient civilizations from around the world, one of the things that became apparent to me was that this hidden struggle has been shown in flags and crests all throughout history, showing that there are two symbols that have dominated our entire history from all the way back to the early time of the Sumerians and Akkadians. And these two symbols may be known to those around our society, but not really understood. And those two symbols are the eagle and the serpent. Eventually, these symbols would become inverted to their opposite meanings and I trace that back to the rise of the Holy Roman Empire when Christianity became dominant throughout the world, in which they demonized the serpent to be an evil symbol, and the eagle became a symbol of truth and power. However, as we're gonna discuss and get into, these two symbols go far deeper than just that, and truly define an ancient struggle that has been known as a war of the gods and war in heaven throughout our entire history. And it's an ancient struggle that truly does define everything in our entire past. The earliest depictions of these symbols go back all the way to the Garden of Eden and an ancient tablet known as the Legend of Atana. Now you may remember learning about biblical stories discussing the Garden of Eden and how we're told that the serpent tempted Adam and Eve with the knowledge of good and evil. But why is that a bad thing? Isn't that strange? And there's this mysterious God figure that is telling them that they shouldn't want that information. The more that I've looked at this story, the more that I've seen that that God figure really isn't this God as we think of it of the universe and the creation of everything, but is actually a rival God named Enlil, one of these Anuna gods. And that's where this struggle really comes into play. Because at its core and at its heart, it's not really just about what the symbols represent, but about the roles that these gods took up in our reality. And that struggle still continues today. In the legend of Atana, it describes how these Anuna gods of Enki and Enlil assumed roles within certain aspects of a reality. And if you remember from earlier episodes, I talked about how Enki took on the role of being a god in the underworld. Now that story is first discussed in the legend of Atana, and it states that he was tricked into ruling in the underworld as being a certain benevolent, powerful god of incarnation and our destiny, but became demonized and turned into this Satan Lucifer figure. But that's where the story really begins. Because by us understanding that Enki was a god of wisdom and was the god that's responsible for creating us in perfection, it really doesn't make sense that he could be the evil player in this entire story. But that's where I want our mindset to go here, is understanding that some of these gods and the roles they took up and the perception of what these symbols represent now to us has been inverted to its completely opposite meaning. So, thinking about it in that way, the serpent is the one that gave Adam and Eve the knowledge of good and evil, but they were cast out of the garden by Enlil, this god figure in the Christian religion. Now, his symbol became the eagle. How the eagle is represented was slightly different in some parts of the world. The indigenous people of the United States saw it as being a symbol of truth and honesty and rising to higher states, but that's not what this symbol originally meant. And it has nothing to do with the actual bird itself. Let me explain a little bit further. The way we can understand what these symbols mean has to do with the specific roles that these gods took up within our reality. If you remember, Enki took up a role in the underworld. The symbol of the serpent represents the earth, wisdom, and knowledge, but also the divine feminine energy of creation. That's why he was a creator god of us. Divine feminine energy doesn't just mean female. It has to do with the right brain, imagination, knowledge, and connecting through the pineal gland. And we're gonna get into what that means further along. 
Now, what does the eagle represent? Well, to the ancient Sumerians and Akkadians, the eagle became a symbol that represented power and war and domination over others and higher awareness. Now, think about that for a minute. Because Enlil took up a role as being the controller and ruler of our entire realm here in the physical world. As, as a higher dimensional being that watches over everything in our reality. That's why he was playing that role of the God figure in the story of the Garden of Eden. Now think about that for a minute, because if you study the Old and the New Testament, this figure, Yahweh, this God figure, it's not a benevolent being at all. In fact, it's a very cruel being that wants to control us and use war as a tactic against us. And a good example is that if you study the book of Numbers in Deuteronomy, where it discusses how Yahweh was commanding Moses to attack and destroy entire towns and cities and kill every woman and children connected to these ancient bloodline gods, these Nephilim figures that were ruling over that region known as the Sons of Anak. Now why, if this is really God, the creator of everything in the universe, this benevolent loving figure, why would he command him to kill entire groups of people unless it's not really God at all? And that's where I want our mindset to go is that there became this great division in heaven, as they say, the higher dimensions over these groups of gods, the Anuna gods, over our reality. Now, where did that start? Where we find it is in the Nag Hammadi scriptures in something called the secret book of John. And in that, we find out two important things. Not only are these aspects of these roles of these beings known as the archons, which means the rulers, but it actually goes on to state that they're the rulers of our reality. And that's where I want us to understand this from a higher perspective, is that these Anuna gods are not just these physical beings, but they're often these non-corporeal, powerful beings that literally take up roles in the hierarchies of our reality. And we're simply these players in the, in, caught in the middle of it. And we're simply these players caught in the middle of it. Now this story continues further in the Nag Hammadi scriptures and the secret book of John, discussing how there's a figure in there known as Yaldubath, who I think is the same figure as Yahweh, who in this story discusses how he's a cruel and a jealous God over humanity and that he's threatened by how powerful the perfect man that was created, Adapa or Adama, became. Now that gets back to when we were discussing the myth of Adapa earlier on. Now if you remember, I talked about how Adapa was called the greatest among the Anunnaki in that story. It connects exactly to this Nag Hammadi scripture book of John, where this figure in the story, Yaldabaoth, is a cruel and jealous God and doesn't want us to reach these higher states. It goes on to state that he casts us down in the lowest form of all matter and created chaos in our reality. Why would he do that? The reason he would do that is to trap us in a reality where we can never ascend. Now remember back to where I was talking about the Adrahasis, that line, Enki, where you went, you were to undo the chain and, and set us free. I think that's exactly where this comes into play because it means that not only if our lifespans are only 120 years, if it's difficult for us to reach ascension through knowledge and wisdom, now imagine if you created a reality that wasn't random at all, but instead was dominated by war and conflict. That would trap people in an endless cycle of incarnation here. And that's exactly what this jealous being did. So that's why when we look at the Garden of Eden story, this God figure, the secret book of John and the Nag Hammadi scriptures, Yaldabaoth, as well as the Christian text with Yahweh, I believe they're all the same being. It's this being known as Enlil, who was playing the completely opposite role as Enki. Now remember for a second, polarity and duality are constants in our universe. It means that these beings are allowed to play those roles. And that's exactly what they're doing. Now, it doesn't justify his actions of being jealous over how powerful we are. It's still cruel and evil, but he's allowed to play that role. So instead of being angry at that, we simply must rise above it and overcome it. That's why I want this information to be imparted on society, so we truly understand this hidden struggle that's existed all throughout history. The most important aspect to understand about that is through the use of symbols. Now, symbols represent the language of the ancients. Now, some are literal and some are symbolic. And the truth I've found is somewhere in between. Now, where we see that in the best example starts in ancient Sumer, Akkadia, and Babylon, where it showed murals of these Anunnaki figures with wings on their back. But instead of just having human heads, sometimes they were shown with different types of symbols as heads. 
And that's something I want to really get across so we can understand. Now, when a being is shown in a mural or some kind of an ancient symbol with a certain kind of head, but a regular body, it's talking about their mentality. It's not supposed to be a physical representation. And that's something that's very difficult for a lot of people to understand. But once you start to, you'll see that it's being shown all around us. Now, in a lot of these ancient murals from Sumer, Acadia, and Babylon, it shows these Anunnaki figures passing knowledge through the symbol of the pine cone, which means seeds of knowledge. But remember, knowledge is not simply just about something good. You can pass along the knowledge of something bad as well. And in this case, a lot of these depictions show them as eagle heads on their, on their bodies. And what that means is they're passing along the knowledge of war and conquering and how to become a powerful empire. And what do we see? All throughout history, that has been the great catalyst that has destroyed so many of these civilizations around the world. And that's where I want our mindset to come to. Now, on the other side of this, we see another symbol that's shown on the heads of some of these figures. We find that in the Ubaid statue from the Fertile Crescent region of Sumer, where instead of an eagle, it shows a serpent head, meaning serpent-headed. Now think about that for a minute. If the serpent represents knowledge and higher states of energy, that's why you would show one as being a serpent head and one as being an eagle. It's the different mentalities. But that's something we really need to understand for a second. If Enki is the god of knowledge and wisdom, that's why the symbol of the serpent would be associated with him. We're taught that the serpent is an evil figure. Now, the metamorphosis of the serpent into its highest state is the dragon. So I want you to stay with that concept as we go further and discuss ancient civilizations around the world, because what we'll find is that these symbols are shown all across the entire world, from the Americas all the way through Asia. These are the most common two symbols we find everywhere, the serpent and the dragon, and the eagle and the phoenix. These are both the states of the mindset of these gods and the knowledge they imparted in those civilizations. Both represent higher states, but they're in a different way. Now let's go deeper. The symbol of a serpent doesn't only represent knowledge and wisdom, but it represents divine energy of creation as well as the higher states of consciousness and energy. Now why was the serpent used? If we were to look and understand the ancient symbols like the rod of Asclepius or the staff of Hermes, we see a rod in the center, which represents our spinal cord, and this coiled energy that goes around it. That is known as the kundalini energy within us. Now, in order to achieve that, we have to incorporate wisdom and knowledge into our life and balance. And when we do that, it allows us to reach these higher states of consciousness. That's the key to us getting out of this incarnation cycle here. It's basically the blueprint for how we can ascend to leave this realm. But that's guarded, and that's why it was inverted to its opposite meaning. All of this was hidden from us whereas the eagle represents the divine masculine energy, which is not a bad thing in itself, but in an unbalanced state, it can be the most chaotic and destructive energy on the earth. Think about how an empire goes and conquers other nations, killing everyone and destroying those places. That's the opposite of what we see with the serpent. When one looks at flags and crests and murals throughout history, nearly every empire in our entire past has shown the symbol of the eagle or the phoenix on it. This is a telltale sign that Enlil and his son Ninurta were literally controlling and rising up these empires to dominate and destroy others around them. But it goes a lot deeper than that. Because what we first find is that the original civilizations that were created around the world, whether or not it's the ancient Kamishans, known as Egypt today, which had the symbol of the serpent on their forehead representing knowledge, all the way through ancient Sumer and right through the Mediterranean area, through Asia, Japan, and the Americas, we see the symbol of the serpent and the eagle nearly everywhere fighting against one another. But originally, the civilizations that were created in their perfection and purity always had the symbol of the serpent and the dragon. Let me give a good example of that. Let's travel to the Americas, right from the Maya realm down through the Aztec, even into South America. What we find is that they almost always depict the exact same thing. It's the serpent or the version of the feathered dragon, the metamorphosis of the serpent in its highest form. Nearly everywhere, it dominates those civilizations. Now, I get a lot of questions on how could you think that way if the later cultures were shown through blood sacrifice and war? 
That's because it didn't originally start there. Now, if you remember from the Lost Civilization Megalithic episode, I discussed how we have evidence all around the world for different cultures have come and gone at different times. But the original basis of those civilizations, the original pre-Maya, the original pre-Aztec and Toltec, and Olmec, down through the Inca, they were created in a perfect state where they worshiped the stars, celestial nature and balance, but they later became corrupted. And I have a great example to prove that. Several years ago, I traveled to Chichen Itza in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. And around where all the tourists are scrambling to see the Temple of Kukulkan, there's something off to the side that almost everyone ignores and hasn't been talked about. There is a platform known as the Platform of the Eagle and Jaguars. And on that gives us the exact example that proves that this war and this secret conflict all around the world with these gods has been happening and it's depicted in that ancient platform. And what it shows is the god Kukulkan, the original dragon serpent god, that was there that created the Mayan civilization and when the temple of Kukulkan was built in honor of ascension. And think about it, it has dragons at the bottom of the stairway, guarding the path of ascension towards the top. Now, in that depiction, Kukulkan has another symbol right next to him. It goes from passing the knowledge of the serpent and dragon to all of a sudden there's an eagle. This eagle is eating the seed of knowledge, the pine cone. He's consuming it. It's telling us a story. It's telling us an ancient story that was left behind to show that the original serpent dragon cultures were later corrupted by the eagle. Now what's even more fascinating about that is that if you look into the Maya and Aztec, their warriors that went into war as, as they became a warring culture were known as the Eagle Warriors. Now let's go even deeper than that. Look at the history of that region later on. When we look at the ancient Spanish Empire, the Romans, all the way through Asia, we find that the great empires that have arose there have at least a hint in some of their flags and crests or even as a dominant symbol of being the Eagle and the Phoenix. And that's exactly what we found with the Spanish. Now think about the history of the United States. The conquering of the Americas, right? Mexico down through South America, first by Cortez in Mexico, and then Pizarro in South America. They had on their flag and crest, the symbol of the eagle. And what did they do? They came over and conquered the serpent dragon civilizations and destroyed them, and then built right on top of them. Now, what's the proof behind that? We find that with what's known as the flag of Mexico. Now, it's very important to mention that this was not the original flag of that civilization. It was something that was imparted by the Spanish to secretly show the history of their domination. It's hidden right in plain sight. It's right in front of us, and yet we ignore it. And what does the flag of Mexico depict? It shows an eagle consuming a snake. And that shows us the hidden hand that this struggle has been going on all around the world. So imagine, if you will, Enki and those around Enki that were part of passing knowledge and balance with the universe and cosmos, this divine feminine energy of creation. Imagine they travel around the world and create these civilizations and then they leave. And then the empires of the eagle come through and then conquer and destroy them. Now it wasn't just with that aspect, it also occurred with secret societies. There were secret societies of the serpent, known as the Brotherhood of the Serpent, and then there were secret societies with the eagle. And they became at war with one another and eventually the eagle was able to conquer the entire world. Now look at today in the United States. The primary symbol we have is the eagle and we've become one of the most powerful military empires of the world. It's hidden right in front of us in plain sight. These symbols are still dominating our entire reality and it means that these gods have been at war for thousands and thousands of years and it hasn't ended. Humanity is being puppeteered by these Anuna gods, and they're showing it through the symbols. Now, one more point I want to make. The other reason why we know the symbol of a serpent doesn't represent something evil is looking at the rod of Asclepius and the staff of Hermes, also known as the Caduceus. These are some of the most important symbols by cultures around the world, and they show this ascension of energy through our medical establishment and reaching good health, right? Good health would also equate to reaching a higher state of energy. So why would those symbols of the serpent be used in those high-level establishments if it was evil? We've been tricked. 
Just like we have to change our understanding of ancient civilizations, how old they were, and which ones give rise to building and then being destroyed to then have another culture come later, we have to also change our mindset of what these symbols represent. Because once we know the truth, we'll be free of their control. And that's what the whole point of knowledge being disseminated down to try to regain the truth of the past is all about. Now one of the areas I want to expand on to have us understand this in a deeper level, let's travel back to Chichen Itza with this platform, the Eagle and Jaguars. So who is this Eagle? I want to point out that it's not just Enlil. It represents this pantheon of gods that became divided. And that's the most important thing to understand, is that there were 12 royal Anunnaki gods known as the Elohim in the Hebrew Bible that became part of this great struggle and they became divided. Half of them became part of controlling us through this duality of higher dimensional awareness through controlling by empires and war and dominating, while the other half ruled through providing us knowledge and wisdom to help us reach our highest states. And these two have been struggling all throughout history. Now, if you remember from a previous episode, I discussed how Enki went into the underworld to be a positive counterpart, to be part of incarnation and knowledge and wisdom. But who is he the positive counterpart to? That's important for, for us to understand this entire story. Therefore, getting back to Chichen Itza with the platform of the Eagle and Jaguars, who was this Eagle figure? And what I've found is that it's not actually Enlil in this case. He was part of empires in other parts of the world, like the Holy Roman Empire, along with his son Ninurta. But there's another figure in history that seems to be playing this counter role with Enki everywhere it goes. It wasn't just Enlil and Ninurta. There's a mysterious figure in the underworld known as Nergal. Nergal's specific role in the underworld was a god of war, and his symbol was also the eagle. It's been right in front of us all along. Nergal's role was to play the counterpart in the underworld to Enki. As above, so below. There's a positive and a negative in the higher dimensions, and there's a positive and a negative in the underworld. And so what happened was Enki and those associated with Enki and other incarnations of beings, such as Toth, seemed to travel around and create civilizations in their image. And Nergal would come through later and corrupt them, but through a very deceptive means, through the means of corrupting them through blood sacrifice and war. And we find that with the Maya and the Aztec. And what I see when I study the platform of the Eagle and Jaguars is that this God that's shown in this Eagle form was called God El in the Maya. And I tracked the exact symbolism that God El is shown in the Maya to Nergal in ancient Sumer. It's all the same thing. They've been playing the same roles all throughout history, where one side of these Anuna gods would rise us up to give us knowledge and power, and the others would corrupt us through blood sacrifice, war, and deception. And these two sides have been battling all throughout history. Now, look at our state of the world today. The original serpent dragon gods around the world have been destroyed. They're all gone. Seemingly, it seems that the eagle has won here. But there's something else going on. As we pass into a new age, consciousness is rising again, since everything is cycles. And just as the Maya predicted, these old control systems are crumbling all around us. The control of the eagle is now losing its grip on our world and our reality and we're starting to rise up to realize the deception of these two controlling factors. That means that the more we study these ancient texts, the more we understand that the wisdom and the truth has been there right in front of us all along. And we simply need to listen to what they're telling us and not be controlled by them any longer.